Previously, we covered these colored zones that you see in the design tool camera visualization and how they relate to the pixel density specifications uh, here in the camera visualization zone settings. We also alluded to some functionality that helps uh, particularly with analytics based design. This is what we're going to talk about here. This is under the tasks tab and you see there's there's three different task specifications for uh, ANPR, FaceRec, and General Video Analytics. We're going to start with face recognition here, and there's some there's some previous values in here. Depending on if you've used this before, yours may be different, or your software might have some different default values. Uh, but these equate to the uh, pixel between the eye settings. So here, like we're using a default of 64 millimeters between the eyes, and if we're saying we want 80 pixels between the eyes, then you know, it does the math saying that we're going to need 1,250 pixels per meter to meet that specification. And we can set some maximum offset angles for the camera, vertical and horizontal angles to the face here, like you see the 10 and 5 degrees. And, you know, of course, you can you can change these settings. You can plug in any numbers you want. But usually if you're doing analytics based design, your vendor of choice is going to have some recommendations for you. So, for example, this is from iPro's latest spec sheet regarding their uh, AI engine for face recognition and, and face detection. And, uh, you know, we can see some angle ranges they recommend here and sizes of the face. Here's another one from uh, analytics vendor Ventura talking about face size in the image and uh, these offset angles as well. So I'm going to I'm going to use something close to the Ventura specifications in this design. But of course, you know, you would use whatever is most appropriate for your software and your design goals. So we're going to go ahead and plug in 20 degrees for our maximum horizontal and vertical offset angles. And uh, because the Ventura software is pretty good at face recognition. We don't need uh, necessarily high settings. So uh, per their spec sheet, recommending a minimum of 25 pixels between the eyes, we're gonna, we're gonna move this down to say 40 pixels uh, between the eyes there to give us a little bit more room uh, with our design, a little bit more flexibility. So we'll plug those numbers in and we'll see how this impacts the, uh, the view. So initially nothing changes. So what we need to do to apply that to a, a given camera is we come down here to the task setting for that camera and we tell it we're using this camera for, for face recognition. Then it's going to pick up those settings that we just put in. So here we see initially we've, we've got a, uh, we, we've got a good angle, but at 12 degrees, but we've got very low pixels per foot. And as you might imagine, if we look at the field of view settings. We're working with a 1080p camera. We've got a 50 foot wide field of view uh, that's 57 feet wide at that distance. So we'll adjust these parameters to something that's going to be a little more normal for face recognition. Let's say maybe we want to see something, you know, about 10 feet or so away from the camera. Um, our PPF has increased to something that's that's in the acceptable range. But now our angle of incidence from the camera to the face is 46 degrees. So. Uh, a lot of times face recognition vendors are going to tell you to move the camera down to something you know closer to eye level so we're going to put this camera let's say at at six feet and here we've got uh you know uh, we we've got a good we, we've got good pixel density but we've still got too much of a of an angle here this is partially because we're calculating um, across this entire range. What we can also tell the software, since we're setting this camera up specifically for face recognition, we don't necessarily care about everything um, from the ceiling to the ground, so to speak. And we're gonna say, we only care about a zone that's four feet above the ground or so. So now you see we start to get some red zone here indicating where we'd get the right pixel density and the right angle uh, to an object, it's going to be closer than our than our initial target distance. You know, we were talking about something around 10 feet away from the camera here, and you see we're not quite hitting that that 10 foot distance. And we, you know, we can do a few things to uh, we we can potentially narrow down the field of view width, uh, uh, you know, adjust the viewing angles, things like that. The other thing that the software makes it real easy for us to do is we can say, well, what happens if we change this from a two megapixel camera? Uh, we've got some really good, you know, eight megapixel cameras on the market today. Let's let's take one of those and see what we get here. And now you start to see that that zone increases, and and we can get good face recognition, you know, out to a much larger distance from the camera or at a closer distance uh, 
with a wider field of view. That might provide us some design flexibility. Uh, we, we might want to say adjust our target height down just a little bit. That's going to help or might say that gives us some opportunity to move our camera up. Maybe for aesthetic purposes we don't want it to be quite so obvious and we're going to mount it maybe do like a, a dome on the ceiling eight foot tall or so and, and again we can see where this will um, where this will work for face recognition and where we start to get beyond any of our uh, angles and, and requirements so this is really good for simplistic uh, viewing of, of these zones and areas but what's really nice about this is that we can also look at it from a, a 3d view perspective and more importantly we can start to take into consideration the kinds of things that we might normally encounter in a real world design. So I'm going to change these, change these parameters a little bit. We're going to narrow the, the field of view a bit. Bring this out. So now we've, now we've got a really good, really good face recognition zone here that you see from the, the top view and the side view where we're going to be getting those um, that level of, of pixel density. But what tends to happen is in real life, we have things like say walls that get in the way. I'm gonna draw a wall here. I see when I do that, because we've got a wall in our field of view, you can see that in the 3D view here. And let's also, uh, let's place a person target So you see here, we've got a wall, we've got a person, and this is showing us that obviously if this person is behind the wall or partially obscured behind the wall, we're not gonna see their face and we're not gonna get good face recognition detail. So this is nice, you can start to model out what your environment looks like in real life. And let's take this a little bit further here. I'm gonna draw, draw another wall. And we're gonna simulate what could be a hallway or an entry area into our building or into our lobby into, into some interior area. So I've got these I've got these walls here and so we can see in, in, in front of the wall uh, we've got good we've got good offset angles here and coming up the hallway here we'd be able to see this see this person and as we're seeing here you know, 14 degree angle to their face uh, from the camera mounting height, good pixel density. But let's take a look at this a little bit more. One, one problem we can run into is if people are coming down the hall and intending to turn left or turn right, they may be walking, moving at a bit of an angle. So when we compute this in here, when we, when we adjust our person model with an angle, this also shows us for this camera position uh, what angles they need to be facing in order for the face recognition to work per the specification. So someone's coming down the hallway and already starting to curve left or right, that can impact how our face recognition algorithm may or may not be able to see enough detail on the face. So these are some handy tools when you're doing face recognition planning to not think just about simple pixel density and do I have enough pixels in this area, but to also think about do I have the right angles? Will other things in the field of view potentially impede my ability to, to see the person or see their face? And uh, this can help us pick maybe say better camera mounting locations if we're particularly concerned about people coming down the hallway and going a certain direction. We might choose to move our camera location a bit and say, if, uh, if people mostly come down the hallway and then move to the right, maybe this left area is a, is a dead end zone or just a, a location we don't care about. Uh, we can adjust our, our camera position and we know that we're going to be able to get good face recognition angles, even from people coming around this, this corner a little bit um, and increase our probability of, of detection. So these tools really help you quickly play with your, your designs and your models. And again, we're just using some generic camera parameters here. Once we've decided on our camera location, the resolution parameters, we've let the software uh, calculate the focal length, the lens we would need to meet this design criteria here. If we wanna take this design a step further and actually put together a proposal based on it, we're gonna to need to pick a specific camera and not just some generic parameters here. So there's a camera database here that we can look at. 
Uh, this has got thousands of models and, and resolutions. You can scroll through this. You could sort by by resolution, things like that, and, and certainly find some options, but there's an even faster way. If we take a specific camera and right click in and say search in database, now what we've done is we've pre-filtered the database down to the cameras that actually fit the parameters that we've uh, decided upon in our design. And so now we've got a much shorter list of options, but still you know, quite a few to sort through here, potentially some brands that maybe you might not recognize or might not have available in your region. So we can take this even a step further and let's say that we've been doing a lot of work with Hanwha lately and we'd like to base this design on a Hanwha camera if we can. Pick Hanwha from the list and now you see we've got a handful of options from Hanwha that, we, that would fit these design parameters. So we might say, okay, this is going to go, it's going to go indoors. Um, I want maybe this, say this uh, flush mount dome here and I can specify that specific camera for my design. And so now you, you can see here, we've got the manufacturer and model number here. Um, and it's telling us now for that camera, because it's got a slightly different sensor format, we're gonna need to be at 7.87 millimeters. This also shows us that camera comes with a 2.8 millimeter, a 2.8 to 8.4 millimeter uh, verifocal lens. So this, this tells us as well, uh, by looking at this and, and we've, we've got a little more zoom to go, this lets us know that when we get in place and, and if maybe something is just slightly off in terms of how and where the installer mounted it or a measurement was slightly off, we're not at the, we're not at the maximum zoom of the lens or, or the, you know, the widest or narrowest focal length. We've got a little bit of room left there to, to tweak the lens if we need to and we can also tell by looking at our zone here that we've got enough coverage that, that if things don't, if reality doesn't line up quite perfectly with the design, we can still most likely make this work in in real life so uh, some nice options there for helping take your designs once you've blocked in the basic parameters and drill it down a step further to picking specific cameras and making sure that the the very specific camera make and model you chose for your design is going to work well in real life and still give you enough flexibility in case you need to uh, alter any of the parameters once you get on site with the installation when we're thinking about camera designs that involve analytics, particularly things that are very detail oriented like face recognition, it's important to not just think about the physical parameters of the field of view, but also the network and storage impact. So uh, here, if we come up into the network bandwidth and disk space tab, you can see we've got some default parameters for this camera, say H265 compression uh, at 10 frames per second. Now again, depending on what we're using for our, our face recognition software, let's say if it's an external server-based software, uh, there's a chance they don't support H.265. So we, may, we might end up going with, say, with like H.264. Um, and we might want to make the frames per second 15 frames per second. Some face recognition software, again, prefers more frames per second. So changing these parameters, you can see how this will uh, adjust our, our, our bit rate and disk space requirements. So see here, as we change frames per second, it'll reduce disk space and bit rate. So we can, uh, we can dial these parameters in, or we might even say that we're, we know that we're gonna be running this at 7,000 kilobits per second. And what is this gonna do to, you know, uh, that'll directly correlate to bandwidth and it'll help us with our storage calculations here. So this kind of helps us take a holistic view of a face recognition camera design, starting from making sure that the software is aware of our design parameters in those task settings, doing a basic layout, dialing that into a specific camera, and then taking it beyond just the visual and into the network and storage side of the equation to make sure that we're planning uh, the rest of the infrastructure around the project correctly as well to get to not just the performance requirements of the camera and the software, but also the retention goals or requirements of the project as well. 